So this is our last uh, sermon in this um, series of the seas of Christian living. Um, we've been we've been at this now for quite some time. Uh, nine, ten weeks we've been um, talking about seas of Christian living, and we're going to wrap this up this week with communion. Now, if you want to see the other ones, we've talked about crisis and culture and conflict and being content, living in community, confession, charity, character, being certain. And last week we talked about children and how they are a gift from God, a heritage of the Lord that we need to train and discipline them and that children are to obey their parents. But it's really a charge for all of us because we are all called to the family of God to um, raise these kids up in the way they should go. So today, um, looking at communion, uh, Les asked me the obvious um, uh, this week. He said, so are you having communion? Are you serving communion? And uh, I really... I really thought about it, and I, I hadn't talked to um, Pink and Louise. Pink and Louise have always made communion for us, and uh, Linda's helped, and Woodworth's have helped. But um, I, I decided not to. And, and you're going to see when we get into our, our, our second point, um, maybe why, why I decided not to. Uh, because I want us to have a teaching and to digest it a bit before we um, are presented with what I'm presenting you with today. Okay, you'll, you'll see. So Luke twenty two nineteen is how I want us to start this. Luke twenty two nineteen, pink read us 15 and 16, but let's read 19. Uh, Jesus says, uh, or the scripture says, and he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So in your uh, bulletin, do this in remembrance of me. So what we're talking about today is an object lesson. It's an object lesson that is to that we participate in to remember what has been done for us. Now... We call it communion. There's really no uh, place in Scripture that the word communion has been used in, uh, in direct um, reference to this. Uh, we'll, we'll see um, a little later, uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 10, 16, um, the King James translates a word communion, but that's the only place they, they translate the word communion. So uh, we could get our, our title from that verse if we use that version. Um, other Bibles will call this, what we're talking about today, the Lord's Table, the Lord's Supper. That's what a lot of um, Scripture will refer to communion as. But I'm hoping that we all understand what I'm talking about is the, the unleavened bread that's been prepared for us and the cup that's been prepared and the act of taking that bread and that cup together as a body of believers. That's what I want us to talk about today. That act, that thing we do that in remembrance of our Lord and Savior. Okay, so we're going to talk about three things about it. <laughs> the first thing I want us to talk about is the institution. Where did we even, why are we even doing this? Who told us to do this? Why, why is this something that Christian churches do? And we're going to go back up to what Pink read us this morning in Luke chapter two, twenty-two, 22, verse 15. And, uh, uh, and when, I'll go back to 14. And when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. 
And uh, so th this is the eating of Passover is where we see the institution of what we now call communion or the Lord's Supper. It was at the Passover. Now, what I really like about this, and if I were you writing this in my bulletin, I would write capital T-H-I-S. Because it wasn't like Jesus hadn't had Passover with the disciples before this one. But it was, he said, I have earnestly desired to eat this, this Passover, this one. I have earnestly desired to eat with you. Last year he ate Passover with him. He never said that. That's recorded. The year before that, he'd eaten Passover with him. And it didn't record that he said that. In fact, he himself had eaten Passover for probably 30 some odd years. But it was this Passover that he had des eagerly, eagerly desired to eat with them. It was because at this Passover, he institutes the Lord's Supper. Okay. So, let's see. We're going to just start through the Gospels. I know we'll get back to Luke here again. But let's, let's go to Matthew. And we'll just start... That Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So we'll go to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26, verses 26 and 28. Super long chapter. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, it, it blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body. And he took a cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. What in the world? What in the world? Do you understand? I, I don't know. Has... Have any of you um, sat through a Passover Seder? Uh, actual Jewish... Oh, say, so Frank's nodding his... Or Frank, ay, ay, ay. Um, Ken's nodding his head, yes. I thought there was somebody else. Somebody else? Uh, Tom. Yeah, Tom has sat through. Anybody else sat through a Seder? Oh, okay. It's very, very uh, strict, right? Like, there's this happens, then this happens, then this happens, then this question is asked and this question is answered and this statement is made and this thing is ate and this thing, everything is very ritual, very set. Okay? So they've gone through, they've gone through that, that Passover and then Jesus breaks rank and he takes some bread Asks God to bless it. Breaks it and says, uh, take eat, this is my body. What? That is not part of Passover. That is not part of Passover. Then he takes the cu a cup, raises it up, blesses it and says, hey, all of you drink of this. All of you, drink ye all of it. Right? Everybody drinks them. This is my blood of the new covenant. What? He's changing the Passover. He's making it new. He's, he's fulfilling the old, bringing in the new. Yes, Tom. Absolutely. See, he's fulfilling it. He's fulfilling it, but not without promise of a hope. It's not like it ends. It continues new. We'll talk about that in verse three, or our third point. 
But right now, in the institution, he is saying, now listen, this bread, which is the bread of haste, right? So we have to think about the Jewish Passover. Where did it start? Back in Exodus, right? They're getting ready to leave the Egypt. The 10th plague of, of death is coming, and, and the Lord tells Moses, you tell them to kill a, find a perfect lamb, slaughter it, put the blood on the doorpost and lentil, stay inside, eat unleavened bread, the bread of haste, that even can be made Sunday morning at 8.30, 9, 9 o'clock and be ready for service because it's the bread of haste. It's not the bread of sit, let it rise, punch it down, let it rise, roll it out, cut it, blah, blah. It's the bread of haste because they were supposed to eat this with their shoes on so they could get out of there. It's the bread of haste, but not anymore. Now Jesus says, this is my body that's broken for you. Take and eat it. And then he takes this cup of wine, this cup, that really wasn't anything really to do with the original Passover. There's no order to make sure that you have a cup of wine. But the, they had gone through and they had added these cups of blessing and cups of this and cups of that. And you're going to see when we get to Luke, there's a couple of them. But he takes that cup. And he takes it and he says, listen, drink all of it. Because now this represents my blood. And it's a blood of a new covenant for the forgiveness of sin. What? Not the covering of sin. The forgiveness of sin. And it represents it. It's not like they drank it and they went, ah, my sins are forgiven. No, 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 no. This represents the blood of the new covenant. I, my blood, my blood is what's going to pay the price not to cover up your sins, but to forgive them, <laughs> cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Wow, this is different. Okay? So he's instituting this at the Passover. Look at Mark, Matthew, Mark 14. 22, and as they were eating, he took bread and after blessing it, and uh, broke it and gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Wow, this is so different than what they're used to. You, I'll, I'll drink some, you drink some. Do I drink some? Yeah, you drink some, you drink some, you drink some. Oh, you just, that's the blood. That's my blood. It's going to be poured out for many. <coughs> Luke, we'll go back to our opening text. Luke 22. Now we'll get a, a little more of it, 14 through 20. And when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he, sat to, he said to them, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you the truth, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom come, of God comes. And then he took bread. When he gave thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup is that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Wow. Wow. So he takes and he changes the meanings of all these cups of blessing and cups of this, thanksgiving and cups of this, and he changes it to, listen, that first cup, that's a cup of a promise. 
that one day we'll do this again together in when the, the kingdom of God comes. So I, I'm stealing my thunder for point three. But he also says in that last cup, this is no more, this, this now is the cup that represents my blood of the new covenant poured out for many. He institutes it. He changes it. He establishes the new covenant represented by the blood and the, the, his body and the blood. It's the bread and the wine. He's um, saying it's going to come. It's coming. And this is what you're going to do to remember it. Okay. Then we get to John. And John records foot washing. <laughs> Never once records breaking of bread and, and um, uh, uh, drinking of a cup. Never. You know what he records though? He records something that nobody else records in John chapter 6. Go to John 6. In John chapter 6... Verse 52, I mean, we could really, this is quite a, this is quite a, um, a teaching Jesus is giving. It, it starts clear back in uh, verse 22. It really starts back at the beginning of 6 when Jesus feeds the 5,000. He ends this, this whole event by walking on water and then giving this great sermon and this great teaching about the bread of heaven coming down and feeding their ancestors in the desert. Now, God had met their needs. And then he says, I'm the bread of life that comes down from the heaven. And, and look, and what he says, what he says in verse 52. And he says, then the Jews disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give his, his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Look. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Interesting story. When you take and eat something, it becomes part of you. When you eat or drink something, it becomes part of you. Your body has been made to take that and bring it into itself. Right? And Jesus is saying, listen, just like food, so are you and I. We are intertwined now. If you really believe and eat on my flesh and drink my blood, if you really take it, it'll be just like you really ate it and drank it. You and I are going to become intertwined. He says it different. I am the vine, you are the branches. In another place, John 15, isn't it? See, he's giving these examples. I'm in you, you are in me. We are in the Father, the Father's in us. The, we are all one, right? That's the thing. Um, how far do I want to go? 58. As the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the Father ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. See, <clears throat> John records really what Jesus is reiterating at the Passover. Remember when I told those guys they got to eat my flesh and drink my blood? Remember that? And everybody got so upset and everybody said, wow, that's a hard saying. Now, I had just fed them 5,000 of them, remember? 
Remember? And then that I, I sent you guys across the boat, and I went up and prayed, and then I walked across the water. And Pete, you remember, right? Yeah, yeah, I remember. And we got over there, and people met us again, and I started going, you just came here to eat because you were hungry, and you don't remember. You don't really know what the miracle was. And they said, oh, what do we do to be? And, and Jesus says, you want to do the work of God? Believe on the one who, whom he has sent. Oh, and by the way, you got to believe so much. Eat of my blood, or drink of my blood and eat of my flesh. What? Remember? Remember when he did that? Remember when I said that? Take, eat this bread. This is my body. Take, drink this cup. This is the blood of the new covenant. It's going to be that real. You guys, when you eat this bread and drink this cup, as real as that has become, as part of you, that's what's going to happen to us. Do it to remember. Do it to remember. <clears throat> but I can't throw off on John and him not recording the, all the events of the, the night of Jesus' betrayal. Because he does record a super important part. And I love the way he begins recording. In, in John 13, uh, uh, it says, Now before the feast of the Passover, before they had reclined at the table, before he broke the bread and gave it to him, and before he blessed the cup and told him to drink. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. With much desire have I desired to eat this Passover with you. I know what, a, what I'm about to do is going to make me sweat blood. I'm going to battle my will. I'm going to give it up. I'm going to suffer and die for you. My body's going to be broken. My blood is going to be spilt. But you know what? We are going to become one. It'll all be worth it. So, do this to remember. It, you don't know what's all about to happen, but I do. Do this to remember. Okay? So that's the first thing we do is we see that he institutes it in Passover, taking an old covenant, fulfilling it as the Passover lamb himself, but then he fulfills it in his death and resurrection, and he's pre-preparing them by saying, this is something I want you to do to remember me. All right? Then in the second point, 1 Corinthians 11. So here are a bunch of Jews now told that your Passover now means this. How? So what do we do? Now, now we get to tell... Uh, you know, Jewish believers who can say, hey, you know that bread of haste, remember how we represent that, and blah, 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 and, you know, it really, the uh, now it represents his body. You know how we have to have sacrifices for sin, right? You know how something has to die. You know how, but now they had to tell heathens <laughs> the same thing. The Gentiles, the others, they had no idea. Some of them, the Judaizers did. I mean, there's some that followed Judaism, but there's a lot that were just like, oh, now what? What are we doing? We're eating bread and drinking. You know, do we have to? Can we have a little lamb with that too? Yeah. Potluck? I'll bring the lamb. You bring the bitter herbs. I'll bring the Doritos. You know, you got that. Okay. We, we'll get together. And it got a little wild because you know what? 
uh, uh, the Gentiles did when they got together. They got a little wild. They got a little wild. And in Corinthians, Paul is like, oh, yeah. he's trying to set them straight, right? Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 33, he says, So then, brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. You guys are getting ridiculous. Some of you are getting drunk. What? This was supposed to be, this was modeled after the Passover. The Passover. What's the Passover? <laughs> Let me tell you. I don't, no, no, I'm not going to tell you. You know what I'm going to say? The bread is the body. The cup is the blood. Remember that. Discern the Lord's body in that. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. See, he's going to put it in order here. Because, remember, you're mixing two groups of people. Yeah, all the Jewish converts understood bread and cup. And Passover. They understood that. Gentiles didn't. Most of the Gentiles were used to debauchery and, and wild orgies at dinners. At potlucks. And now these guys are trying to bring them together and say, listen, listen, listen. We got to put this thing in order. <laughs> so... One thing we see, and you know, you, you can argue with me, and I used to try to argue with this, but in Acts chapter 2, after that great sermon that Peter preaches, um, uh, Dr. Luke is kind of recording the events of the day, and then he kind of gives this summary in Luke chapter 2, verse 42. He says, and they, these, group, these 3,000 souls right above it, that were baptized and believed on Jesus, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. The breaking of bread isn't just like uh, th this um, phrase is talking about not just eating, like, oh, they went and had dinner. It's the breaking of bread. This is um, the Lord's Supper. Okay, this is being specific. They're saying they did this. They devoted themselves to taking what we call communion, the Lord's Supper, the, the new covenant, this new representation of the old becoming new, right? And they did that. It says they devoted themselves to that. Well, how often? Well, you go down here, down, down just a little further, for, and day by day attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. They received their food with gladness and generous hearts. So they didn't only break bread, they also did have a food program. Remember, you guys, what Luke is telling us. <sighs> Remember, this is at the Passover. Um, the, all of this taken place, then... Jesus is crucified, and the disciples are hiding. And then 50 days later at Pentecost, they were filled with the Spirit. And who's at Pentecost? All the believers that were at Passover. So here's Jerusalem flooded, clogged with um, uh, the disciples that have come from all places because they were all called to show up in Jerusalem three times a year, Passover, Pentecost, and um, uh, Day of Atonement. They had to appear right there in this brand new, fancy, fancy temple. Beautiful, huge, gigantic, amazing temple. They were supposed to show up there three times a year, and this was one of the times. But they were changed this time. This time, they were filled with the Spirit of God, and 3,000 of them in one day were saved. 
3,000 of them. How would you like to go from 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12? There? Well, there's a little more than 12. That's how many? A little more. They, they say maybe 100 in the upper room. To 3,000. No wonder they were giving what they owned to try to, we got we to figure out how do we take care of these people. And how long are you guys going to stick around Jerusalem? Aren't you going to go home eventually? You got to go home. You're just here for temporary. You're just here for Pentecost. When are you going to go? Oh, they went to the, it it's kind of reminds me of, uh, where was that last revival? Asbury? Was it Asbury? Some chapel? And and all of a sudden, when the, the revival breaks out, right, people just start hanging around. They don't go to class. They don't go to work. They just hang around. That's what happened in Acts chapter 2. Now, I'm not saying this should be a good picture of the, um, how the church should run, Acts chapter 2. Because this is what happens at revival, and eventually people go back to where they came from, and they carry the light with them. They carry the fire with them. They don't just stay there and burn in a little bonfire. they got to take it to the world, right? So, but they did daily break bread. They remembered what happened 50 days ago. <clears throat> now, in uh, Corinthians, where Paul is trying to rein in the crazy Corinthians and get them to fit in with the uh, overwhelmed Jewish believers, he says this, For I received from the Lord that which also I delivered to you, that the, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you, do this to remember me. Isn't that what we saw in Matthew, Mark, Luke? In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So Paul is saying, okay, so really what we're here for is to remember that the bread represents his body, the cup represents his blood, and we have a new covenant. That's what we're here for. Not for um, the rowdy old potlucks. Potluck. Crazy Gentile potlucks. Right? For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Some Bibles say announce. The, 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 the point is that that word is like declare. It's like preaching it. It's like, like uh, some, some say show, shoe, shoe, S-H-E-W. It's to speak of, it's to teach. It's like you're, you're giving an object lesson. Hey, look, his body, bread. Like the bread that came from heaven. He is the bread that came from heaven. Look, it was broken. Crack, crack, crack. Now take some of it. Cup, blessing. Look, dark red. Like blood, blood of a new covenant. Take drink of it. Because now you aren't covered, you're cleansed. You're announcing, you're preaching, you're teaching, you're speaking of the Lord's death. 1 John 2, 2 says he is the propitiation for our sin. That's the bread. But Hebrews 2, look at this one. I like this one. Hebrews takes this and really gives us the, the idea. Hebrews 2, 14 since, therefore, the children share in flesh and blood, we do, right? We all share in flesh and blood. Poke somebody next to you if you need to be reminded. Huh? What? What's he saying? He himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those 
who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surety, surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to make like his brother in every aspect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. He became flesh and blood. And because we're flesh and blood, that flesh and blood is what we remember him as giving his body and his blood for us because we are flesh and blood. True, absolute propitiation, substitution. <laughs> so, it's that serious, it's so serious that I didn't, my secretary didn't write the next section. 1 Corinthians 11, 27. We're going to go back and finish, this out, finish out Paul's command. 1 uh, Corinthians 11, verse 27 says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy worthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Wow. Let a man examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and the drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died or fallen asleep. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, brothers, when you come together... To eat, wait for one another. See, we should be approaching this as the body and blood of Christ to be discerned as this isn't crackers and juice. This represents the sacrifice, the propitiation, the new covenant for us. It should not be taken lightly. It should be discerned so, what does that do for us? Well, that's why I didn't serve communion today. Nobody should walk in and go, oh, it's communion? I didn't know it's communion today. Huh. When's communion? First Sunday of every month, right? Now, I have a fix for that. I have a fix for that. I don't have the logistics of this fix, but I do have a fix. We could just have communion every Sunday so that you would never go. Is today communion? You would have it every Sunday. You know what that would cause us to do? Every Sunday, examine ourselves before we get here. Make sure we're in the right mood, right state of mind. But... I leave it up to the congregation because Pink and Louise are going, <laughs> 52 weeks, please give me a break, right? Right? But maybe somebody else would need to step up before the congregation decides to do it. But the thing is, it would never be a surprise and it would be orderly and properly done. Now, I'm not saying what we're, not, we're doing right now isn't orderly and properly and reverently. But my wife can't be here the first Sunday of every month because she and Christy do children's church. So then we kind of have to say, well, honey, you want me to take it with you kind of by yourself? Or no, I'll wait till next month. It wouldn't happen if we just did it every week. But then, does it become routine? Yeah, could. Absolutely could. But so sitting in that pew, <laughs> it could come, become pretty routine. Uh, let's just go listen to him talk. He's going to go over again this week anyway. Uh, let's check our schedule before we go in there. If we have to be some sort before 1230, yeah, let's just skip. We'll watch it on TV. The thing is, it can become regular. 
Everything can become regular at church. So, orderly and properly. If, my, if I had my preference, we'd have it every Sunday, and we'd have it with wine. There, I said it. I would. Wine has properties that grape juice doesn't. Wine has properties that represent the spirit better than grape juice that sits out. If you, we leave it for a month in the refrigerator, it turns yucky. It's not good. I mean, I made that mistake one time. I went in there and I'm like, oh, what's this? It's, oh, it's vinegar. <laughs> right? It was not grape juice anymore. But we will leave it to the family meeting second Sunday of every year. Literally, second Sunday of every year. So let's finish this thing up. The turkey's going to get dry. Third step, Luke twenty two sixteen. This is really that um, the promise. See in Luke twenty two sixteen, Jesus um, takes that uh, getting ready for the pa for the Passover. Okay. <laughs> I thought that was you, not the chair. <laughs> Twenty-two sixteen, for I tell you, I will not eat until I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup when he had given thanks and said, "Take this and divide it among yourselves." For I tell you, from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. There's a promise here. Until it is fulfilled, there is a promise here. Now, how do we know when this instituted new um, Lord's Supper, this new covenant, has been, been fulfilled? Well, this is the interesting part. Um, in John chapter 10, Jesus is saying, I'm the good shepherd, right? I'm the good shepherd. My sheep know me. They hear my voice. I know them. But then he says, now listen, I have sheep of another fold. And I'm going to go get them so that the two may become one. Just like eating bread and drinking um, the cup becomes one with you and you become one with Christ, they're going to become one with us. I'm going to have one flock. Look what Corinthians says. This is where I think the King James might um, translate this word uh, uh, as uh, communion. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10 says, The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? Um, some Bible, or the King James is the only one that says, Is it not a communion? In the blood of Christ. The bread that we break, is it not a participation or communion in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we are, we who are one body, uh, for, for we all partake of one bread. See, we all eat that bread together. And that makes us one. One with him and one with another. Consider the people of Israel are not those who eat the sacrifices or participates in the altar. He's saying just like they who went to the altar and ate the sacrifices, you, you do know that the peace offering was eaten. They were, it, was, it was like a potluck. In the Old Testament, when they brought the peace offering, it wasn't just all given to the priest. They had to bring enough people with them that they could all just enjoy it. And, and it says, hey, look, when they ate it, they all kind of entered in together. That's what we're doing here with communion. We're, we are fulfilling it because, or he's fulfilling us by bringing us all together. Remember, in Romans chapter 11, Paul tells us blindness came to the Jews in part so that we, the wild 
olive branch could be grafted in until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. He's going to have those other sheep come in. But then Paul says, but don't forget, all of Israel will be saved. All of it. It's going to be perfect. It will be fulfilled in the kingdom. That's why in Romans 8, 23, we'll see when Paul says, look, we're waiting for our full rights as adopted sons. The redemption of our bodies. No more bad livers. No more bum knees. No more kidneys given out. We are going to be, this body is going to be redeemed. It will be fulfilled. The promise that there will be a day that he eats this new with us in the kingdom is a promise that it will be completely fulfilled. Not just Jewish believers, not just Gentile believers, but all believers in Christ. All believers that have partaken and believed in that. In fact, in Revelation 19, 6 through 9, we see John the Revelator seeing the fulfillment of this. He says, When I heard what seemed to be a voice of a great multitude, <coughs> like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted for her to clothe herself with fine linen and bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Guess what's going to be served? Bread and wine new with him all of us in the kingdom that's why he told he that's why matthew records it that's why mark records it that's why luke records it they all record jesus saying i'm not going to eat this i'm not going to drink this until i eat it and drink it new with you in my father's kingdom it's a promise also so Today, to close up, I'm going to ask if you turn to Chorus 217. We're going to sing, There is a Redeemer. Chorus 217.
Heavenly Father, I do praise you and thank you that you've given us the new covenant that you have sent us a redeemer. Lord, when we do take communion together, let us remember and discern that as the, the body and blood of Christ, not just crackers and juice. And Lord, thank you for your spirit because there is plenty of work on earth to be done. Help us to step up and do it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, potluck downstairs.